the next five to 10 years. We are now a recognized specialty. EMS medicine is part of the House of Medicine. We need to start waving our flag. So I'm gonna to talk to you today a little bit about what we're doing in South Carolina to address this issue. Expansion of medical school, enrollment, and building of new medical schools has been going on since the days post-World War II. Things took a hit, though, in the 1980s where no new schools were built for 20 years. But then, as we projected a physician deficit, which we are now, rounding out the millennium, 15 new schools have been created and established in the last four or five years. Okay, so we have 15 new medical schools, which brings our total count of medical school programs, of allopathic medical education programs, to 141. But this is still only one third of what we need in physician workforce as projected by the Association of American Medical Colleges. So you might recognize some of these schools in your community, Arizona, California, Connecticut. Three schools have expanded in Florida, three in Michigan, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Texas, Texas Tech, and Virginia. So University of South Carolina School of Medicine, Greenville, the Liaison Committee for Medical Education, which accredits medical schools, like COAMs for EMT and paramedic programs. The LCME has new standards for medical education, not just for these 15 schools, but every school across the United States. When they're up for reaccreditation, they all have to follow this new curriculum, which primarily takes students out of the classroom. Now students are in the classroom only an average of 24 hours per week. Instead, they are in small group discussions, they're doing projects, they're self-learning modules, the LCME requires problem-based medicine where we are introducing clinical cases that have been integrated into the biomedical sciences. And the one I like, we have to introduce clinical medicine right up front on day one. They're putting the white coats on on day one. We have two clinical courses at USC. One is clinical diagnosis and reasoning, which is all the hands-on stuff, the histories and physicals, laboratory testing, radiological imaging, all the procedures and then integrating of all these cases into the six core competencies of medical education. We have another course called Medicine and Society, which is really the humanities and behavioral sciences. It includes ethics, culture, diversity, professionalism, communication, interprofessional health, statistics, EBM, research, and emergency medical technician training. Yes, we are the only school in the United States that are training our medical students and future doctors to be EMTs. Now, I want to give credit to Hofstra and Long Island Jewish because they are training their students to be EMTs, but they don't require maintenance of that certification. Okay, we require that they maintain that cert. And when they finish the EMT course, we're a registry state. All of our students have to undergo national registry testing. Again, they have to maintain that certification for two years. Their requirements are one 12 hour shift on the ambulance every month that they're in medical school for their first two years. And they have to write a patient up once a semester from 911 dispatch until hospital discharge or rehabilitation, following the patient through the entire medical uh, events that that patient has gone through, okay? Using a clinical pathological correlate format. So our first EMT class, our charter class started in 2012. We front loaded it. It was the first six weeks of medical school was the EMT course. Uh, the state required five patient encounters. We had nine examinations. Then the next year, this past year, we extended the course out into the whole first semester. And I'll tell you why in just a few minutes. But we extended the hours, mostly in the lab, the hands-on, to get from the brain down to the hands. Okay? And we incorporated the EMT course with gross anatomy. And when I talk about that, this is a schedule, EMTs in blue, anatomies in brown. When we were teaching our students cardiovascular emergencies, and a BLS class, teach them how to do CPR. That afternoon, they're in the lab, cutting open the thorax, looking at the, the heart, looking at the lungs, and understanding what compressions do and the distance between the sternum and the anterior vertebral processes and why compressions really do matter. Similarly, when we were talking about abdominal emergencies and blunt and penetrating trauma to the abdomen, that afternoon, they're cutting open the abdomen, they're looking at the orientation of the organs, and actually putting their hand down in Morrison's pouch you know, and looking at that, those uh, colic doctors, okay? We, find, we finalize our EMT course each year with a capstone functional exercise. We divide the class into groups, 
and they have to undergo two scenarios, a motor vehicle crash or an active shooter, mass casualty incident response. We do it on hospital property. In the background, you see the facilities, development, physical plant building where we do the MCI, and the construction parking lot where we wreck the cars. So we have actual vehicles. We have live patients that are screaming and yelling inside the cars, all blue lodged up. We do use some mannequins. That's not a real baby. I was going to say it was, but you know, somebody would have brought up that being that bad. Um, uh, for the mass casualty incident, we had uh, 80 students from Brinkley Technical College and Clemson University that, uh, uh, that participated. So our exercise, our students were up at the top of the road when the exercise started. We had uh, police cruisers, fire apparatus, EMS vehicles, ambulances coming down very fast, lights and siren, to put the students in the mood. And we actually set up these scenes like it would be in real life. With the active shooters, we just congested the parking lot with the police car, 12 police cars, and everybody went in with weapons drawn. Our students, all in blue helmets there, were uh, part of the extrication team. They were divided into squads. They worked with fire uh, departments. They were put in the cars to hold uh, manual stabilization of C-spines. Uh, working on the child, the mother was screaming the whole time, so we really did simulate uh, a real scenario here. Uh, we did do an inject. Of course, you have to have an intoxicated patient that left the scene but has come back now. And we picked out one student in every group based on their in-class snottiness. I'm sorry, their in-class academic endeavor. We selected one student who got hurled on. And it even looks good. I would strongly suggest, everybody has their recipe, I strongly suggest Campbell's Chunky Vegetable with two shots of Jack Daniels per bag. It works very well. <laughs> Nothing, it, it was great when you can hurl on a medical student. For the mass casualty incident, uh, we, again, we had 80 patients coming out in waves, everybody blue lodged up. All of our students got to participate in casualty collection, uh, setting up triage and doing treatment in all the green, yellow, and red zones, doing all emergency medical care there. And students were debriefed after the exercise before they went on to the next exercise. So how did we do? The first time that we took our practical results, we did okay. Okay, we had an 88% pass rate in the first class, up to 96% extending it out. Okay, did that make a difference? We had a few that had to remediate and come back, but after the fifth attempt, everybody could pass. For the written exam, we did very well. 98% pass rate in the first class, 96%, uh, but 100% did pass by no more than two attempts at the written. I hope they were just reading too much into the question. So we went back in 32 weeks on the first class and said, what is the retention? Do they remember what we taught them? And so we picked out two national registry scenarios, cardiac arrest and patient assessment. And we put them through it. And we found that almost 50% failed okay, with cardiac arrest, which was very concerning. And this was unannounced. They had no prep time. Just one day, we put them into the scenario. For patient assessment, look at that. We had 15% pass. The rest failed. Maybe because they've been doing clinical medicine, learning how to do a physician, physical exam, I don't know. Or they forgot about the checklist, I don't know. But that was concerning. That's why we extended the class for the entire semester. Okay, so how much does the program cost? 80000 for the first class, 88000 for the second. That includes contracts with Regal Technical College, although I gave 80% of the lectures. But anyhow, they were there with the adjunct faculty. Okay, so those are the costs of the program. Our future challenges are an expanded class. Okay, we're going up to 75 this year and then 100 uh, in two years, and that'll be our full complement. The LCME allows you to take 10% more, so we'll have 110 in our class. Um, what we plan to do this next year is, or this coming August, is we're actually decreasing the number of classroom hours to 130 uh, more online self-learning modules as well, but we're continuing to extend it out and integrate it into anatomy. So the benefits of this type of program is number one, early clinical experience for our students. Number two, it's the first introduction to interprofessional health. That's a big buzzword today. Learning to work in a team. Understanding our first responders. That's the first medical team when you think about it. And the scholarly activity. We have five students now conducting research in some EMS-related uh, topic. I think the big thing is this. Our students are appreciating the other side of the railroad track. Our students are all spring of baby boomers. They've been fed with silver spoons. You've seen this. They're going to be dermatologists and radiologists one day and ophthalmologists. People who make a big cash. They don't know how the other side lives and are disenfranchised parts of our society. They've seen it now. They understand it. Maybe, just maybe, they're going to be a little bit more sympathetic in cussing out a patient 
for not giving their hydrochlorothiazide prescription when they've seen families that are just trying to put food on the table, single parent with five kids sitting around. Okay, so that's our big benefit. Uh, and this is reflected in some of the reflections. All of our students have to write reflections midterm and at the end of each semester on what they've learned and how they've acted and how they hope to change their own personalities. And most have written on an EMT experience. If you look at this, the majority of our students are writing about something that has happened to them during their EMT rides. There's positive and negatives. The positives were the majority. The negatives were not so much about the EMS system, but the negative perception of healthcare providers when EMS arrive. The trauma surgeons that come in and don't give EMTs and paramedics enough time listening to them, all that kind of stuff. So that was the negative part of this. And even this uh, class this year, uh, we don't have the results from uh, this semester, but you see that they were very into the EMS uh, perception as well. So uh, that's it. I hope. My dream is that we will continue to wave our flag, we'll continue to educate all healthcare providers in what we do and how we act and what we can provide. So the end of your conversations with physicians one day will not be, yes, we do carry oxygen in the back of our ambulances. It will be how you're telling that physician, how you're managing the chronic medical problems of hypertension and diabetes with their patients who are working in a community, paramedic, situation out in the rural environment and undergoing strategies for wellness, exercises, medicine, nutrition, and all the other things that make our population.